Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we give coaches and consultants practical ideas for taking you to the next level in your business and in your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who've walked in your shoes and offer real world experience that you can apply to your own journey. Welcome back to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I am just so delighted to have with me today, Libby Gill. Libby, welcome to my show. Thank you, Meredith. Happy to be here. Well, I'm so excited to talk to Libby. She and I have known each other for, gosh, four or five years now. And like so many of my wonderful guests, she and I originally met on LinkedIn. And so I just have to put a plug in again for that platform. And Libby is an executive coach, a leadership expert, and an award-winning author. And we became friends kind of instantly, didn't we, Libby? Yeah, As we, we did. discovered that we both have a real passion for developing strong leaders and really having a positive impact in the world. And Libby, uh, uh, that, her background is very different from mine, which was in <laughs> education. Libby used to be the head of communications for some of the media giants like Sony and Universal and Turner Broadcasting. And she was also the branding brain behind the launch of the Dr. Phil show. So she's got just a fabulous background in communications. And she founded her Los Angeles based coaching and consulting firm. It was 20 years ago, wasn't it, Libby? It's this November, 20 years. It's mm -hmm. hard to believe, isn't it? No. Yeah. And I read her first two books, which were great. And then she came out with this third one. And I just loved it as well. It's called The Hope Driven Leader, Harness the Power of Positivity at Work. And I love that title, Libby, just because it... It is so upbeat and positive, and um, it, it uses a word that we don't uh, talk about very often in the context that you describe it in your book. So I'm really interested in going deeper with you on that. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about your journey from corporate to having your own firm. Well, as you mentioned, I spent my entire first career in, in Hollywood. I worked in television. And, um, and, and it was a great career. I started with what, what was then Norman Lear's company. He was the producer, really legendary in TV, behind All in the Family and all, all sorts of hits that were, at the time, very forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how, what a great opportunity, this little, little company. I'll get to learn everything and meet everybody. And very quickly, that company was bought by Columbia Pictures, and then they were bought by Coca-Cola, and then that company was bought by Sony. So. You know, my head was swirling, but I decided I'll just kind of raise my hand and see what happens. And in five years, I went from being an assistant in the PR department to being the head of publicity, advertising, and promotion, promotion for Sony's worldwide TV group. And then, as you mentioned, similar roles at, uh, at Sony, at uh, Universal and Turner. And it was great fun. I started by launching the show Married with Children, which was my first solo job, launching the PR launch of that, and ended with Dr. Phil. And by then, I thought, you know, I've kind of done that. I've done that career. There wasn't really anywhere higher to go. I didn't like the, um, the pace of the film world as much, which is very slow. And I thought, you know, what I really loved, I just looked at, you know, what did I love about the job? And it was producing leaders. It was bringing this talent up through the ranks and turning my, my kids, I say with affection, now anybody under 40 is a kid, um, <laughs> but they were kids and, and really helping them develop as executives and then help develop their careers. And coaching was a new field. I think I read about it in Newsweek. Um, it was like, hey, there's this new thing. And, um, and I was intrigued and thought, wait a minute, that's what I love, the communication, the teaching, the training, the developing people. So, you know, I went out and studied and became an executive coach. And like you said, it's 20 years later. Well, during that time, you learned some things related to this topic of hope. And I want to really go deeper with you on that because, and I think a good place to start is your definition of hope and hopefulness. 
so mm -hmm. that we understand where you're coming from. And why was this such an important topic for you to write a whole book about it? Because I think that's, that's an interesting question to delve into in itself. Well, to me, hope was, it's, it started as sort of a personal, it was my belief that hope is what gets you out of bed in the morning. And I grew up in a very chaotic, really rocky kind of start with an alcoholic parent, mental illness in the family. And it was really like, what's going to make tomorrow better? And I started young. It seems so strange now, but my dad was a doctor did not believe in self-help or self-help books or any of that it was all nonsense. And I literally, I can remember so clearly reading the book Psycho Cybernetics, which was a huge hit way back and hiding it under my mattress. Like it was, you know, a playboy or something. So nobody would make fun of me for reading a self-help book, but I was on a mission. I was looking for how do I make my life better? And hope became the mantra. And so I wrote a book called Traveling Hopefully, which was just about the personal journey. And then as I became an executive coach, I started to really just to dig in and see, is there, is there anything more to this, just this idea of hopefulness? And in fact, there is a body of science called hope theory. So it is not simply my definition, but it, it comes from the medical and positive psychology communities. And hope theory says that hopefulness is not like optimism, which is a great thing. It's a, that's a sort of a generalized belief that things will be okay. Things are going to turn out all right, but that hope is specific in situation and actionable. So it's an idea that you are linking belief to behavior, setting a goal that it could be very ambitious, but is also attainable. So it's, it's got an element of pragmatism, reality, and it's really that future-focused vision. So it requires a belief that change is possible and also a sense of agency, that you can get yourself there. And you bring a group of like-minded people that are heading in that same direction towards that future-focused vision, and they're unstoppable. So to me, that's sort of the layperson and the more clinical uh, definition of hopefulness. Well, before I get into some questions about specific parts of the book, I'd just like to kind of pull back and ask you to talk about what is it you're hoping a reader will take away from this book? What's the impact you'd like to have? Well, no surprise. I found my early, not my, just my early personal life, but my, my professional life was difficult. Entertainment studios are not particularly warm and fuzzy. And when it comes to people development, they're far behind. When I left that world and started coaching and working with other organizations, it was eye-opening to see how progressive, in fact, many groups are in terms of developing people and caring about them and wanting to create a positive culture. So it was really about this sense of, I, I want people to understand that, that, you know, we hear the hope is not a strategy or hope is not a plan. But in fact, there is an actionable element of it. If you say, this is what I believe, sort of core values, this is where I want to go. Now, how do I connect the dots and create a culture where people believe that they've got the ability to, to play a bigger game, to elevate what they're doing? And, you know, there's so many cultures that are fear-based or lacking trust or respect, and they really sort of beat the life out of their employees, sometimes in big, huge ways. Other, other times, it's just that little bits of sort of whittling away who you are. But the cultures, and, and I remember vividly early in my coaching career, going into two very similar media companies, and one was celebrating some, it wasn't a huge anniversary, but it was some sort of special day, and it was throughout their entire building. There's an ice cream truck and balloons and, you know, things on the wall that people were celebrating. And, and it was so vibrant and so rich in, in just embracing and celebrating their own people and another company, it was like, they didn't know who I was or why I was there, but told me what floor to go to. And I walked down this sort of quiet, sterile hallway lined with uh, filing cabinets. And you didn't hear a word. You didn't, And it was just daunting and unfriendly and intimidating. And just those two glances is with, which is the hopeful culture? And which one do you think is going to attract and retain employees? And it was so clear. And, you know, those were two big companies that sort of just attacked their people responsibilities from two different perspectives. And I thought, there is something here. And then the more I learned about, 
you know, that you can really create the culture that you want. It's a lot of work, as you know, because you do a lot of that work with leaders. But it's not, it's not an accident when companies create this very people forward, not just saying people first, because I don't think there's a company on the planet that doesn't say people first, but the ones that mean it. And that creates quite a different atmosphere in a daily environment and a striving to go beyond what's in your job description. So with the book, then, your goal is to, I know you give lots of examples. So to help people kind of get a picture of what that looks like. And one of my favorite stories was in uh, chapter three, where you talk about servant leadership. And so I'd love for you to tie in this whole idea of hope with servant leadership and share the story that's such a fabulous <laughs> one that's the best example I've ever heard <laughs> Thank of, you. of that in action. Well, servant leadership, I mean, there's a lot of literature on that. And it really is believing that, that your people come first. And I love leaders that say, I, I work for my people. They don't work for me. I work for them. Mm. And really embrace that idea of... It's what I can do to build my team and my people that makes me as a leader stronger. It makes the, inter the entire enterprise stronger. So I was doing a consulting day with this company called Abbott Health. And it was one part of the company that had just been acquired by Abbott. So this was a sales division, the whole Midwest region. And they were new. So it was a new merger, which can sometimes be rocky. In this case, because these leaders were so forward thinking, they integrated nicely, but, but it was one of their, their tributes and their you know, salespeople are so much fun to work with because they have to stay self-motivated. They are out there talking to people and they've got to be energetic and they've got to be confident and positive. So I find they really, the idea of hope and looking at the future really gets them going. And this group was after this day long meeting that we had, they wanted to, you know, it was a sales meeting where you honor people and you, you hand out the sales awards. And, you know, we've seen a lot of those and, they, and they're lovely, but these guys wanted to do it differently. So they decided they were going to take everybody and put them on a yacht, which they made us swear we could never call it a yacht because that would not fly with their, you know, their CFO, but it was a big boat and it was this beautiful boat. They were going to ride around the Harbor in Chicago. So nobody knew about this. It was a big surprise. And so people knew that, you know, bring a warm jacket, but dress up. And people were just dressed to the nines and they had their puffer coats and they walked up the ramp of this, up to this yacht. And there were the leaders dressed as waiters, holding the trays. And it's such a hoot. I have a photo of that. And they're in their waiter outfits and they're dressed and they've got champagne and wine and beer. And as their teens came up, they are serving them. And it was not just for that little momentary show. These sales leaders served the entire cocktail hour. They were serving people and then they gave out awards. And, you know, it was the creativity of the, how do we really symbolize? And I think symbols are really important. How do we symbolize that we're, we're here for them? We are, and they thought, well, we'll just do it literally. We will serve them as servant leaders. And then it became so much fun and people got such a kick out of it that they start, you know, all they did is rent their waiter outfits, but they asked people to come up and sign them. So they obviously had to buy their outfits, but the people that got awards came up and signed all those jackets. So they had this incredible memento of a, a really great night where people were celebrated for their accomplishments and people that were new to the team or integrating saw there's this great fun culture that sets the bar high, but really celebrates its people in a fun, creative way that took a little thought. It wasn't just the standard, here's an award and thank you, job well done, <laughs> applause, applause. They really turned it into an event. That's a great example. And so I know you use the term that the servant leaders are shapers of hope. So talk a little bit about what you mean by that. That was a great example. Um, give some other ones just in terms of a day-to-day -day operation. What does that look like when a, a leader is a shaper of hope? Well, I think one thing, we always hear the word transparency, but to me, that, that's a big word. To me, it's information flow. Transparency is, do you go to that big meeting, whatever the you know, big leadership meeting is, do you give that information back to people? I cannot tell you how often I hear, 
well, you know, my, the president of my division goes to the CLT, you know, the senior team or whatever they call it. And we never know what happens. We really don't get the word on how well we're doing or what's happening. So make sure information is going up the pipeline. And you only do that by trust. If people trust you, you know, it can be lonely at the top. And if people are fearful or they think an idea is going to be shut down or you're not going to be happy with bad news, they're not going to share that information up the ladder. But if they feel like, you know, I've got your back, this is a two-way street, they can tell you something in a timely fashion that's important. So that's one thing that I think is critically important. And I had a client that told me he wanted to test it out. And so he put a jar of M&Ms on his desk. And it was, he was kind of looking at, um, if people come in or it was a can, a candies, that if they came in and sat down and grabbed a candy, those were people that were comfortable sitting there with that senior leader. If they didn't, they weren't that comfortable. So he, he watched that for a week to see how comfortable people were chatting and could they grab a candy from the bowl and take it back to their office. And I thought, well, that's, that's an interesting way. It's, it's sort of that comfort level. Do people trust you? Can they relax around you? Can they be who they are? So those kinds of things are important. I think the, the, the career development that we both do, that leader development, if you ask yourself, does this person under me or my whole direct report team and then the layer under them and under them, do they know where they're supposed to be in a year? Do they, has the leader said, you know, where do you want to be in this company? Where do you want to go? How do I help you get there? It, it's in a simple sort of a, a way to gauge that is when you have one-on-one -on -one meetings and meetings are the bane of everyone's existence. That is never going away. And I have my own theories about that. But if you have a one -on -on, regular one-on-one -on -one meetings, which I am a fan of, as opposed to the big, giant, nothing gets done meetings that take forever, tell your people that they need to set the agenda. That is their meeting. You are not only handing over the reins of leadership, but you are teaching them by example that I'm not going to, you can't sit here and say, well, what do you want from me? That's not the way it works. They need to come in to their leader with an agenda. And those kinds of things that build that trust, that build that agency, is another way to say, you, you've got this. You are a leader in your own right. So we're, I expect you to come in prepared and to set the agenda because you're a valued and important member of this team and what you have to say is critical. So it's all these little daily decisions as well as those big overarching things that we do. And I think probably the daily communications are more important or just as important as, as the big communications. Mm -hmm. Those are all such really good points. The, and communication is such a core of all of it. And I like the tie-in you made with trust because to me, this idea of instilling hope in others, fundamentally, you've got to have the trust there for people to be able to hope or believe in in you and the vision or the picture you're painting for the future right it, and that's a key part of it is everybody the senior leaders they know the the vision of the organization that's why they're part of the senior leadership team but have they painted a picture that people beneath them and aside beside them can really see oh wait a minute we've got a five-year plan well, great. You know, that's, that's good. Five-year, 20-year, whatever plans are good for enterprise. But for me as a human, I can think in about a year or 18-month increments. Uh, and that's, but do you know, is it crystal clear? Do you understand? And when everybody can recite, that's the vision. And here's my connection to that. And this is the way I'm going to develop within that because I'm here today, but I want to go over here. And I know what skills I need to build. I know what I need to learn. I know how I need to build my network. And I'm not sneaking around to doing it. I've got full, the, the blessing and the help from my supervisors to do that. I, I think the companies that, that say, oh, you know, I just need to, yeah, I'll stay right here where I am. I can have 10 different careers at this one organization. That I couldn't have in my entertainment days. When you were good at something, they were going to leave you there for the rest of your life. And that just didn't work for me. I, I actually did move to another area of the company to the production and creative side for a while. I mean, that just confuses people when I explain that. Well, I made a sideways move and went down a notch. I kind of worked my way down the corporate ladder before I moved off. 
But I had to do a lot of tap dancing to get into another field. And I think when you say, look, you, you don't just have this one skill. You should always be challenged and learning and growing. And maybe you'll stay and work your, your way up the ladder in this one discipline. Maybe you'll add another two, three disciplines down the road and stay for your entire career. And that with young people coming in, now we've got millennials and Gen, Gen Z, they don't want to hear, well, welcome. We're happy to have you for 30 years doing the same thing that you got hired to do. It's, it's not the world they grew up in. They see rapid change and they want to be part of that. And why shouldn't they be? If you can define a future that they see and think, whoa, I get to do this and then I'm going to learn this and then I'm going to go over here and learn this. That's fabulous. And if you keep them forever, you know, more power to the leaders that can do that. And if you can't, you send them off with your help, your blessing and your connections. I'm so glad you brought in the younger workers because as I was listening to you talk, that was one of the things that came to mind, the ability, one of their needs. And really, when you think about it, all humans, we want the ability to grow and, and learn, even though we might get comfortable in a position, it's still exciting to be able to learn something new. And so to me, the element of hope, using our common thread there of being able to, to see possibilities mm -hmm. and not feel like I'm stuck that, and, and lose hope because there's no place for you to go in this organization. And I think that requires the person's boss as well as the other members of the leadership team to convey what's possible to folks to keep them engaged and excited about their future. I, I agree. I mean, you... Obviously, there are people that will stay in one position, but most people today don't want to do exactly the same thing every single day of their lives. Yeah. So it was interesting. I was speaking to a group at, uh, at, at a large hotel chain, and we, this subject came up. I'm talking about this journey of change and how to infuse hope in your culture. And one man just blurted out, well, yeah, you young people don't want that. And I I was like, oh, really? Okay, so give me an example. And well, I, my young people that work for me, they'll, they'll go somewhere else for a dollar an hour more. And I didn't even have to respond. Somebody else said, you know, can I comment? And I thought, oh, this is going to be good. So this fellow said, you know, I find that, that, that young people do want to be challenged. So what I do is keep a list of, of, of jobs, of projects. So when somebody feel, says to me, and they're allowed to say, you know, I've got a little free time. Or, I, you know, I'm getting a little antsy to try something new. It's either design this form or, or overhaul this or try that. And he says it gives them a great stretch opportunity. It gives them an area. Somebody wants to say, you know, our social media is a little out of date. We need to be on TikTok or this or that. Well, let's give that a trial run and see how it goes. And this fellow just answered it. It's, it takes a little thought, a little creativity, but not a whole lot to say, well, well what, what's got you bored or what makes you feel stuck or what would you like to tackle next? And when you're ready to answer those questions and you embrace the fact that somebody wants to grow, that's, that's powerful. That's what keeps people with you. Absolutely. And related to that, there was another chapter where you talked about essential team communication skills. So it isn't just up and down with the boss but also across members of the team. So talk about those five skills that you feel are really critical to this overarching theme, theme of hope. Sure. It, it's all about creating that positive environment. It was really interesting. This goes back to meetings as well. But MIT wanted to, they did a study thinking, you know, meeting interaction is sort of hard to gauge. But no, they put a, a little device to see where people were looking and what they were saying and how much they were participating. And they found that it was meetings that were the most productive, even if people didn't know the subject matter at the same depth. But meetings where everybody spoke, there was a relatively equal uh, participation level where people did identify, even have some little sidebar questions or conversations, which is just flies in the face of that one meeting, people, that in fact, relevant things can bubble up. And then one thing that I thought was fascinating was once the meeting has this lively level of discourse, and I'm a big believer in start your meeting by what you want to end with. 
you know, we're here today to do X. You either did it or you didn't. And if you didn't, you set another meeting. You just don't go on for another two hours. But that then people take that information and they go out and explore with other people and then bring that back to their team. So now that requires a little time, a little bandwidth, but think how powerful that is when people are on the subject of a, a tech rollout or whatever it is. We're going to talk about it. We're going to decide and we're all working together on this. And then you've got you know a handful of your team or maybe everybody that goes out and does some research and some discovery it could be right in your own organization or outside and brings that back and says, hey, you know what I found out or you know what this team over here is doing. That level of engagement and exploration can be critical to move a team forward much faster than they would move on their own. For sure. So are there any other actual um, communication skills uh, uh, within the team, among team members that really help set the tone? Uh, well, certainly it starts with, there's a funny study that says when there's a team that's leaderless or doesn't have a designated leader, the person who speaks up most is the leader. They are often considered, you know, that's the leader of the team. Mm -hmm. So being ready to engage and also having a leader that's, that is willing to draw people out because I often have leaders who are considered too passive, um, which really means that they're not quite sure what their role in that meeting is. So it does require a little bit of preparation for people that sometimes are in an area, a service wing, so they're there to listen. They feel they're there to listen as opposed to participate. And over time, if you're too much of a listener and not a participant, people begin to wonder, why is this person here? They're not a contributor. So they have to make it very clear that this is the information I'm looking for and this is how, is how it impacts what I'm doing. Or that, and also let me know how my team who does X can better serve your needs. So it's this act of willingness. And that's, you know, a part of that is on the leader, but also the participants to set that level of trust, to set a level of openness that, you want to hear from everybody. You want a lively discussion and it's okay to, it's also okay to disagree. I always joke that, you know, want to embrace your naysayers and they're not really the naysayers, but you do want to listen to people who have a different perspective. And if everybody has that kind of group eye roll when, you know, Joe over there, who's such a curmudgeon, he never agrees with anybody. If you have that immediate negative response to that person, that's going to spread because social behaviors are contagious. But if you say now, you know, Joe or Jane, you, you always have a different point of view. Or I can see from the look on your face, you're something, tell us what you're thinking or punch holes in this for us. There's an interesting thing that they used to do at Pixar where it was, they were there to punch holes in an idea. And I, I think they called it forwarding. And it was, you know, here's the base idea, which is pretty good. But now let's all attack it. And it was meant with a positive spirit. Let's see what's wrong with it. And this can work with finances, with legal, with research, with anything, with product development. Okay, here we are, and that's okay, but okay is not good enough for us. So let's all collectively throw our questions in. And we've got to be, you know, we've got to be good soldiers in this. We've got to be prepared that it, you may take some of it personally, but it's not personal. And so that, some of that is developing that, hey, I can come back from, from something that's meant positively, and it truly is positive. I don't have to get defensive. I don't have to blame other people. I don't have to, to, you know, to guard my territory. I can simply listen to these ideas, and we can all then collectively agree. And Bezos has this great thing. Uh, Jeff Bezos is Amazon. It's uh, a disagree, and it's something like disagree and move forward which is, it doesn't matter if you disagree, once you finally settle on the plan, you move forward on it. And if somebody comes back and says, wait, here's another wrinkle, then you entertain it again. But yeah, of course you wanna disagree. That's how you get to a better, whatever the, the idea of the meeting or the, the group effort is all about. Mm -hmm. what, the word that's coming to mind as I'm hearing you talk about that is neutral to be able to stay neutral when you hear someone raise questions or especially if it's your idea. Yeah. <laughs> and right. so you've got not just ownership, but personal attachment to it. And, 
that uh, tendency that we can have to want to justify or defend can get in the way of really making improvements on the original idea. And it's, it's such, it just goes to that little fear part of us that says, oh, I'm not good enough, or I'm going to be found out, or I don't belong. But if that's all, if that's removed, because you know people really do trust you, and you trust them, that just goes away. You're just able to put your idea forward. And you're an author, I'm an author, you learn early on in the authoring world, it's like, whoa, hate that part, ah, that just didn't work. And you just like, you know, you suck it up, you don't have to agree with every note, but you get so much better when you get that input from different areas yeah. and different people. That's so true. That's a uh, really great points. Um, there's another area that you discussed. It was the chapter on helping leaders identify their unique superpower. Ah. And you talked about a Gallup poll that um, had asked respondents to list three words that described what a specific leader contributed to their life, which I just love that. And so I'm curious, what were some of the top attributes that were listed by these respondents? Well, they took, the study authors took these hundreds or maybe thousands of words and, and codified them. And they, they took the four dominant themes and they said the words that people came up with that, that had the, the greatest impact that were the most helpful from leaders were stability, which to me, we, you know, we are in times of rapid change and lots of complexity. So the leader, even in the time of all this change, they've got to be the rock. They've got to be the stable one. Uh, trust, of course, what we've been talking about. You've got to trust your leader to tell you the truth, to follow through, to do what they said they were going to do, that two-way street. Compassion, which is part of this idea of hope. You're going to help people see the way to a better future. You, you can see the way to, you know, nobody wants to see their way to a worse future or a flat future. We all want to move towards something positive, And that's part of that compassion. I see you for who you are. I want you to be. And I think the world is so much more, at least, at least here in our country and in business, so much more accepting of, of, of gender, um, of race, of all of these things. And we don't have it all figured out, but there is, we are moving towards a little bit more equality in the workplace. And that's a sense of compassion for, I see who you are and I respect you for being, for bringing your true self to the workplace. I didn't see much of that in my early days. It was put on your suit of armor and get ready to duke it out at the office. Mm -hmm. But it is really, and, and it's not just having compassion, but it's showing it. Whether it's somebody's got to take some time off because they've got a sick kid or parent or there's something in their lives. And, and I'm not suggesting you coddle people, but you have compassion for human situation. And people know that. And they really, that develops that trust and respect. And then finally, the last thing people said was hope. They wanted leaders who gave them a sense of hope. They also identified that as direction, guidance, and even faith. They wanted leaders who instilled this sense of hope. We're all going to get there together. That this is, We've got a better tomorrow. We're going to lock arms and, and do this in a positive way, and that the possibilities are, are limitless only by our imagination and maybe quantum physics. But short of that, we can do whatever we, we set our minds to. Well, what's so powerful to me about those four is anybody listening, no matter what their role in life is, can take those and apply them as a parent, as a family member, as a friend. You know, it, people are attracted to us when they know we're stable, <laughs> you know, when they can trust us, when they sense that we're compassionate and we mm -hmm. care because it's yeah. all about caring. And then that hope. I think that we tend to stay away from or avoid people who want either intentionally or unintentionally want to bring us down to their level <clears throat> of lack of hope, uh, you know, despondency, criticism, negativity. And so it's um, enriching to be around someone that we sense is interested in lifting us up. Yeah, I, I believe that completely. And, and we know, I mean, there are people whose roles are to protect us, you know, the governance and the, um, the attorneys and the financial people who were, they're looking up, 
for our mistakes. And that is their job, that due diligence. But somebody in that role can can really make you see, I'm here to protect you and make you better and make the organization safer. And it doesn't matter what your role is, you don't have to be the inspirational leader who's the big visionary creative person. Any role can have that sense of, you know, I've got you, I'm, we're taking care of this together. And we know who they are. We know people that just seem like they're just put on the planet to burst our bubbles, or as you said, to bring us down. And nobody wants that for the long term. And frankly, the job market is good enough that if that's what they've got, they can go out and look for other options. Definitely. Well, as we're wrapping up, Libby, is there any other point from your book that you think would be especially valuable for our listeners or uh, stories from clients who've read your book or heard you speak about this topic and changes that they've made based on your um what they learned from you well i often hear from people who are kind of you know a little skeptical about that hope um i actually spoke at the defense department once and uh and i knew coming in that that the uh, i forgot her rank but a high level officer that was in charge of this area that was her thing hope is not a plan and i said you know i'm going to refute that right it's like okay And by the end, people said, oh, no, I understand what she's saying. You can't just sit there and wait for things to happen. But in fact, hope is a really critical part of the leadership mix. When we define it as an actionable, we are linking belief. I believe I can do better than I'm doing today. I believe I can change my business. I believe I can get 20% growth out of my team, which is what one of my clients said, which was a great rallying cry. Mm -hmm. And then they got there. So all of those things are about creating that hope-driven culture. Well, speaking of that, your book, The Hope-Driven Leader, tell folks how they can connect with you online and also get your book, The Hope-Driven Leader. Well, they can go right to my website at LibbyGill.com. And in fact, they can download the first chapter there and that will put them into my, um, my mailing list so they can be part of the community. And your listeners, I would love, or viewers, I'd love to hear from any of them. If they have a question or they want to hear, learn something or they want my, my hope scale, which I can send them, which was created by one of the pioneers of, of hope theory. It's a, it's a hope assessment. And it's 12 questions, and it really gives you a sense of what's your sense of the future? What's your belief in your own agency? I'd be happy to send that if they just put hope quiz and send that to me. Great. And the, uh, e- the uh, website is Libby, L-I-B-B-Y, Gill, G-I-L-L, dot com. And I know you're on LinkedIn because we connected there. I know you're also on Facebook. We will include links to your website and to your book on the show notes page of uh, your interview when it's posted so they'll be able to find you there as well. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining me today. I've so enjoyed this conversation and I just love the work you're doing and the impact you're having through your speaking and through your one-on-one coaching and other work that you're doing in organizations. Thank you, Meredith. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com to learn how our tools can increase your impact with clients and expand your business. And while you're there, grab our free ebook, The Five Secrets to Getting Better at Anything. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell. Make it a great day.